Empyrean. The Philosophy of History and Politics. Chapter 8. The Civilization Crisis. All the cultures arrived at the point in their development when their possibilities for culture, in the narrower sense, were fulfilled. The life directions of religion, philosophy, and the arts of form were fully expressed and formed definitively. The Counter-Reformation was the period of the definitive shaping of Western religious formative potentialities, and thenceforward, religion was on the defensive against profane tendencies, which gradually increased and finally, with the turn of the 19th century, gained the upper hand. Kant is the high point of Western possibilities in inorganic philosophy, as was his contemporary Goethe for organic philosophy. Mozart is the high point of music, the art that the Western culture chose as its most perfect for its own soul. Naturally, the culture had always had both an inner and outer life. Politics and war had always continued, since they are inseparable from the life of culture man. But in the first centuries of the culture, say until 1400, religion had dominated the total cultural life. Gothic architecture, Gothic sculpture, glass painting and fresco, all these arts had served religious expression, and these centuries may be called the age of religion. This period yielded to new tendencies, less inward, reflected also in the greater development of trade and economic production. The new tendencies are more urban. They contain more adaptation to the external world, but they are still primarily inward. The arts pass into the custody of great masters and become emancipated from religion. The maturity of the culture shows itself in its development at this time of its greatest and most refined art. In the West, this was music. In the classical, it was sculpture. The Reformation and Counter-Reformation are both steps away from the age of religion. Philosophy becomes independent of theology, and natural science challenges dogmas of faith. The basic attitude toward the world is still sacred, but the illuminated foreground widens constantly. This period is the Baroque in our culture, lasting from 1500 to 1800, the Ionic in the Classical. During these centuries, the politics reflected the strict formative stage of the culture. The struggle for political power was strictly within the bounds imposed by the culture soul. Armies were small, professional. War was the possession of the nobility. Peace treaties were arrived at by negotiation and compromise. Honor was present at every decision of politics or war. The later Baroque produced the age of enlightenment. Reason was now felt as all-powerful, and to challenge its almightiness became as unthinkable as it would have been to challenge God in Gothic times. The English philosophers from Locke onward, and the French encyclopedists who adopted their ideas, were the custodians of the spirit of this age. By 1800, the externalizing tendency has prevailed completely over the old inwardness of the strict culture. Nature and reason are the new gods. The outer world is regarded as primary. From having examined his own soul, and having expressed its formative possibilities to the limit in the inner world of religion, philosophy, and art, culture man now finds his imperative directed to subjecting the outer world to himself. The great symbol of this transition in our culture is Napoleon. In the classical, Alexander. They represented the victory of civilization over culture. Civilization is in one way a denial of the culture. In another way, it is the sequel. It is organically necessary, and all the cultures went through this stage. This present work is concerned throughout with the problems of civilization in general, and of our immediate problem for the period 1950 to 2000 in particular. Therefore, it is not necessary to do more than present in this place a bare outline of the significance to the organism of the civilization phase. With the triumph of reason comes an immense liberating effect on the culture populations. The feelings that were formerly expressed only in strict forms, whether in art, war, cabinet politics, or philosophy, are now given free reign, increasingly independent of culture bounds. Rousseau, for instance, advocated the doing away with all culture and the descent of culture man to the purely animal plane of economics and reproduction. Art develops increasingly away from strict form, from Beethoven to our day. The ideal of the beautiful yields finally to the ideal of the ugly. Philosophy becomes pure social ethics when it is not a coarse and crude metaphysics of materialism.
Economics, formerly merely the foundation of the great structure, now becomes the focus of immense energy. It too succumbs to reason, and in this field, reason formulates the quantitative measures of value, money. Reason applied to politics produced democracy. Applied to war, it produced the mass army to replace the professional one, and the dictate instead of the treaty. The authority and dignity of the absolute state are felt as tyranny by the new life tendencies, and in heavy battles, the forces of money, economics, and democracy overcome the state. For its responsible, public leadership is substituted the irresponsible, private rule of anonymous groups, classes, and individuals whose interests the parliaments serve. The psychology of monarchs is replaced by the psychology of crowds and mobs, the new base for power of the man of ambition. Production, techniques, trade, public power, and, above all, population numbers increase fantastically. These numbers are produced by the enormous final life task of the culture, namely, the subjection of its known world to its domination. In an area where formerly there were 80 millions, there are now 260 millions. The great common denominator of the civilization ideas is mobilization. The mass of the culture populations and the masses whom they conquer, the earth itself, and the power of intellectual ideals, all are mobilized. Imperium Chapter 8, Section 2 From the standpoint of the whole life of the organism, this stage is a crisis. For the whole idea of the culture itself is attacked, and the custodians of the culture must wage a battle of more than two centuries against inner attacks in class war. Down beneath the culture, the idea awakens in the minds of intellectuals that this culture is a thing that must be done away with, that man is an animal and is corrupted by development of his soul. Philosophies appear, denying the existence of anything but matter. Life is defined as a physiochemical process. Its twin urges are economic and reproductive. Anything above this level is sinful. Both from the economic leaders and from the class warriors comes the doctrine that all life is nothing but economics. From self-styled psychologists comes the doctrine that life is nothing but reproduction. But the strength of the organism, even in crisis, is too great for a few intellectuals and their mobs to destroy it, and it goes its way. In the Western civilization, the expansive tendency reached the point where, by 1900, 18 twentieths of the surface of the earth was controlled politically from Western capitals. And this development merely brought an aggravation of the crisis, for this power will of the West gradually awakened the slumbering masses of the outer world to political activity. Before the inner war of classes had been liquidated, the outer war of races had begun. Annihilation wars and world wars, continuous internal strain in the form of unrelenting class war, which regards outer war merely as a means of increasing its demands. The revolt of the colored races against the Western civilization. These are the forms which this terrible crisis takes in the 20th century. The peak of this long crisis exists now, in the period 1950 to 2000 and possibly in these very years will be decided forever the question whether the West is to fulfill its last life phase. The proud civilization which in 1900 was master of 18 twentieths of the Earth's surface arrived at the point in 1945 after the suicidal Second World War where it controlled no part whatever of the Earth. World power for all great questions was decided in two outer capitals, Washington and Moscow. The smaller questions of provincial administration were left to the nations become colonies of the West, but in power questions, the regimes based in Russia and America decided all. Where former control was left with Europe, as in Palestine, actual control was retained in Washington. The food rations, trade union policy, leaders, and the tasks of the former Western nations were decided upon outside of Europe. In 1900, the state system of Europe reacted as a unit when the negative will of Asia thought, by the Boxer Rebellion, to drive out the imperialism of the West from China. Western armies from the leading states moved in and smashed the revolt. Less than half a century later, extra-European armies are moving freely about Europe, armies containing Negroes, Mongols, Turkestani, Kajiristans, Americans, Armenians, colonials, and Asiatics of all areas. How did this happen? Quite obviously through the inner division of the West. 
This division was not material. Material cannot divide men if their minds agree. No, it was spiritual division that brought Europe into the dust. Half of Europe had a completely different attitude toward life, a different valuation of life from the other half. The two attitudes were respectively the 19th century outlook and the 20th century outlook. The division continues, and the amount of food a man in the Western civilization can eat is dependent on the decision of someone in Moscow or Washington. When the spiritual division of Europe comes to an end, the extra-European powers will be unable to hold down the strong-willed populations of Europe. The first step in action is thus the liquidation of the spiritual division of Europe. There is only one basis on which this can be done. There is only one future, the organic future. The only changes that can be brought about in a culture are those which its life stage necessitates. The 20th century outlook is synonymous with the future of the West. The perpetuation of the 19th century outlook means the continuation of the domination of the West by culture distorters and barbarians. The task of the present work is the presentation of all the fundamentals of the 20th century outlook necessary as the framework for comprehending and thorough action. First is the idea. Not an ideal which can be summed up in a catchword, or one which can be explained to an alien, but a living, breathing, wordless feeling which already exists in all Westerners, articulate in a very few, inchoate in most. This idea, in its wordless grandeur, its irresistible imperative, must be felt, and thus only men of the West can assimilate it. The alien will understand it as little as he always has understood Western creations and Western codes. In his victory parade in Moscow in 1945, the barbarian exhibited his Western captive slaves to the jeering crowds of his cities, and made them drag their national flags behind them in the dust. If any Westerner thinks that the barbarian makes nice distinctions between the former nations of the West, he is incapable of understanding the feelings of populations outside a high culture toward that culture. Tomorrow, the captive slaves offered up to the annihilation instincts of the Moscow mobs may be drawn from Paris, London, Madrid, as well as from Berlin. A continuation of the spiritual division of the West makes this not only possible, but absolutely inevitable. Both the outer forces are working for the continued division of the West. Within, they are helped by the least worthy elements in Europe. This is addressed, however, to the only people that matter, the Westerners who can feel the imperative of the future working within them. It is necessary that their world outlook be the same in all its fundamentals, and we know in this historical age that the prevailing spirituality of an age is a function of its soul, and that comparatively little latitude is allowed in its necessary formulation. Therefore, the present work contains not arguments, but commands of the spirit of the age. These thoughts and values are necessary for us. They are not personal, but superpersonal, and compulsory for men who intend to do something with their lives. Our action task is dictated for us by the fact that the soil of our civilization is occupied by the outsider. Our inner imperative and outlook on life is determined for us by the age. A part of the outlook of any age is simply the negation of the outlook of the previous age. Each age has to assert its new spirit against its predecessor, which would continue, even in the stage of rigor mortis, to dominate the spiritual landscape of the culture. In establishing itself, the new spirit must deny the hostile old one. In a substantial part, therefore, our 20th century outlook is the negative of the 19th century materialism. Having destroyed this dank ruin, it erects over it its own appropriate view of the world and life. Since this is written for those whose worldview is researched to its very foundations, the preliminary, negative aspect must be equally thorough. The worldview of the millions is the task of journalism, but those who think independently have an inner necessity for a comprehensive picture. The great foundations of the old outlook were rationalism and materialism. They will be completely examined in this work, but here it is proposed to treat only three thought systems, Darwinism, Marxism, Freudianism, products of materialistic thought, all of which were the focus of great spiritual energy in the 19th century, and which, continuing to have a vogue in the early 20th century, contributed greatly to lead Europe into its present abyss.